the Prophet ﷺ brought him under his mentorship and began to coach him and guide him. And like all human beings, he had some really strong qualities and then there were some areas that he was a little weak in. For example, if you open up the hadith books and you read the chapters on um, the chapter of iflas, the chapter of bankruptcy, most of the narrations are his. And it's because when it came to financial affairs, he wasn't too good at it actually. There were many cases where he would be out of money and there would be a whole line of people demanding uh, money from him and those people would come and complain to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that he hadn't paid them back and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa evaluated his finances and found out that he was negative. There was no money to give. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa then also coached him through that affair too. He taught him a specific dua. He said, read this dua. And then after Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa guided him. He told everyone, hold off for a period of time. Let me get him to work. He earned some money and then one by one he paid everyone off. So Mu'adh ibn Jabal anh, relationship with Rasulullah was very broad like that. One time Nabi wasalam, said to a companion that if one person that was visiting Medina, he said to him that if you come back to Medina and you have questions about the Qur'an and I am not around, then go to Mu'adh ibn Jabal. He is the person that I, he named four people. One of them was Mu'adh ibn Jabal. That go to him. He's one of the four people that I attest to that his knowledge of the Quran is complete. So, when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam towards the end of his life um, sent Muslim leaders and educators to Yemen. Yemen is south of Medina Munawwara. So, south of Yemen is Mecca. South of Medina is Mecca, and then south of Mecca is Yemen. There was a delegation that actually came from Yemen to Medina Munawwara, which is referred to in the Hadith literature as Waftun Najran. Waft means a delegation. Najran is this region that's right at the border, somewhere between Saudi, modern-day Saudi and Yemen. There's a big sort of border dispute there. Regardless, at that time it was considered to be Yemen. So this Yemeni Waft, this delegation, came to Medina Munawwara, and it was full of uh, preachers, priests. They were very educated people. They came to Medina and they challenged Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to a public debate. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wasn't one that did public debates. If you were to count the number of times the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his 23 years of prophethood engaged in public debates, you wouldn't be able to fill one hand. This was one of those times. They came and said, we challenge you to do a public debate. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted he said, tomorrow will be the debate. Everyone gathered in Majd al-Nabwi, the Sahaba were there, full house. Everyone was there to see this moment. The Prophet wasallam placed a condition that I won't engage with all 40 of your priests. Only one, of the person, only one person will speak and everyone else can sit behind to consult him if needed. But only one person will speak to me. They agreed. And this discussion started between the two. And as a result of this discussion between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the, the Christians of Najran, a great portion of Surah Al Imran was revealed. Surah Al Imran, if you've read the Surah, you'll notice that it's after Surah Baqarah, that a lot of it is to do with Christianity. And Ayatul Mubahla is there. فَمَنْ حَاجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنْ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا وَبَنَاءَنَا وَأَبَنَاءَكُمْ This was about them actually. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if after all the arguments are presented to you, if you still choose to neglect, then I challenge you. Bring your people, I'll bring my people, and we will say Allah's curses upon a liar. Until the end. Now after this, this discussion was done, there was a good opening for Muslims in Yemen. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started sending teachers there, educators there. Among them were the likes of Ali radiallahu an. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an was also sent to Yemen by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as an educator. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam went for his Hajjat al wadaa when he went for his farewell Hajj, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam came with the Sahaba from Medina. Ali radiallahu an wasn't on the journey with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to Hajj. He actually came from where? He came from Yemen. Very good. And when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa met him in Mecca, he actually asked him, 
He said, what kind of ihram are you wearing? Because there are different types of ihram, right? Ifrad, qiran, tamattu. You have these options of what kind of hajj you're going to do. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa asked him, when you put your ihram on, which, what intention did you make? So he said, O Messenger of Allah, I made intention that, O Allah, my ihram is whatever the Prophet's ihram is. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa smiled at him and then said, okay, you're with me. Stick with me in hajj, right? This is what we call ihram mu'allaq, that you say that my ihram is the same as that person's, right? It's a sign of affection, love, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appreciated it. Ala kulli hal, one of the people who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent to Yemen was this young sahabi by the name of Mu'adh ibn Jabal who was previously a teenager, and just out of his teenage years, if that. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sending him as an educator to Yemen. Now, the historians differ whether this incident occurred before the farewell hajj or after the farewell hajj, so I won't put a time stamp to that. I'll leave it open. What I will say though, it was towards the end of the Prophet's life. Whenever you hear anyone say the farewell hajj, you guys have all heard of the farewell hajj, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's big, momentous farewell hajj, hajjatul wada, khutbatul wada. We hear it, we might see even the khutbah sometimes printed and posted on frame, in frames on walls. It's a, a uh, very auspicious sermon of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whenever anyone says Khutbatul Wada or Hajjatul Wada, I always tell the students in my classroom at the seminary, think of the number 90. Any guesses why 90? Any rough guesses? You can be wrong, it's okay. Why 90? Because that's how many days the Prophet lived. Whenever you were here farewell hajj, just will pin that point in, in your mind. Now you know exactly when it happened. Hajj ends on the 12th of Dhul Hijjah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. Rabi'ul Awwal, I mean Dhul Hijjah, and then the next month is Muharram, Safar, Rabi'ul Awwal. It's three months Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived after his hajj. Three months he lived. Why this is important is because now when someone says to you something happened after Hajjatul Wada, after Hajjatul Wada, you will know this was literally the end of the Prophet's life. These were the last few days. The Sahaba actually say that after Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam returned from Hajjat al-Wada, he was quiet. He didn't talk much. He would stay quiet, just do istighfar all the time. They say that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be quiet in istighfar and he had indicated towards his passing because he said during the Hajj that it's possible that you won't see me performing Hajj again. And the ayah, Al-Yawm Akmaltu Lakum had been revealed, which was that Allah has completed the deen. So everyone kind of had an idea that this was now wrapping up. So everyone in Medina Munawwara would go quiet. One narration, one Sahabi says that we were all just so sad and we would sit quietly in front of the Prophet of Allah. No one would say anything in the gathering. The Prophet would sit there quietly. We would sit there quietly. And we would make dua to Allah that a Bedouin would come to break the tension. And then random Bedouins would come and they'd be chilled and they would say, hey, what's going on? And they would ask Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi some questions. And they said that those people would engage with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet would smile at them, he would speak to them, and we would all benefit from that Bedouin's questioning. One day we were all sitting there, waiting for a Bedouin to walk in, when an anonymous person walked in. And he came to the front of the gathering and sat in front of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. فَأَسْنَدَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ إِلَىٰ رُكْبَتَيْهِ وَوَضَعَ كَفَّيْهِ عَلَىٰ فَخِذَيْهِ وَقَالَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِيمَانِ وَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِسْسَانِ وَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ السَّاعَةِ He asked Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam these questions. Tell me what Islam is. Tell me what Iman is. Tell me what Ihsan is. Tell me what is, when is the Day of Judgment. And then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered him. And every time he answered the, the, the question, or not every time, the first three, he said, Sadaqt. For the first three questions, what did he say? Sadaqt. What does that mean? You spoke the truth. The Sahaba, they say, فَعَجِبْنَا لَهُ يَسْأَلُهُ وَيُصَدِّقُهُمْ We thought, what an ajib what kind of person is this? He's asking the Prophet ﷺ a question and then he confirms it. If you confirm a question, then what does that mean? You already knew the answer. And what kind of person asks a question to Rasulullah ﷺ while already knowing the answer? Because the Sahaba, even if they knew the answer, they would say, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. That Allah and His Messenger know. They wouldn't say sadaqt, that's beyond imagination. The adab and ihtiram the Sahaba had for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is something that needs to be studied again. It really needs to be studied. It needs to be studied properly. Because as time passes on, one thing I see in our youth that's missing is that adab and ihtiram. That respect. 
for seniors, for teachers, for elders, for parents. It's going away because in this Western society we live in, we're all equal. So whether you've, you've memorized the Qur'an, or whether you have white hair in your beard, or whether you uh, pray salah in the masjid or not, everyone says, you're, you're just the same as I am. So they, without any respect at all, raise their voices when they talk to them, and they're very easily dismissive of them. This is not how the Sahaba were. The Sahaba understood the maqam of Rasulullah If you go to the grave of Rasulullah until today, from the men's side, when you go to give salam to the Prophet right above it there is an ayah of the Qur'an uh, uh, engraved right there. Anyone know which ayah it is? Allah says that And the other ayah right next to it is both of those ayat are there, which mean what? When you're in front of the Prophet, lower your voice. Don't talk loud. Humble yourself. Whether you agree or disagree, whole different issue, right? But there's ihtiram. The Sahaba were told not to call the Prophet ﷺ by his name Muhammad. That you can't just call him Muhammad. All these narrations that you find that someone says, Ya Muhammad, most of them are Bedouins. They're outsiders. People in, the, in Medina Munawwara would say, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabi Allah. They would refer to him by his beautiful attributes. This was adab and ihtiram that they had. The story of the love the Sahaba had, Hadayah bin Yaman radiallahu anh, narrates a hadith that when we would sit with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to eat, if we were all just gathered together like a little dinner, no one would touch the food until the Prophet ate first. Everyone waits. One of my teachers who I studied the Mu'atta Imam Malik with, we were talking about the Mu'atta earlier, my Shaykh who taught me Mu'atta Imam Malik, he was a French scholar who was French, second munasaba. Yeah, uh, he uh, and he was, uh, but he was from the Reunion Islands. So we studied hadith with him, very pious man, very pious man. Tahir Wadi was his name, Sheikh Tahir Wadi. He actually studied at the same institute where he taught, where I went to study later on, decades later, after him obviously. When I studied with him, his hair was all white. So much nur on his face. The clothes he wore were very different. All of his clothes, I never saw him wear a, a, a shirt or a pant off the rack. His clothes were all tailor-made, and they were very humble and simple garments. He would read the hadith and tell the tailor, make a garment like this. So I never saw anyone ever selling a garment like that. Never saw it in my life. It was nothing fancy. It was very simple, white, thin fabric, and then he had it made according to certain riwayat that were found in the Shama'il works. He was a very bashful person. Didn't, I never heard him laugh out loud. And even when he would laugh, he would generally look down and laugh. He wouldn't look at the people. And he would very softly giggle while looking downwards. He never looked up at people when he laughed. When we studied Muatta Imam Malik with him, the dars, the lesson was um, one hour long. It was a one hour dars. He was an old man, he would sit there and teach it. And he always sat in the shahud position. You know how we sit in the shahud? Like this, on his knees. And every day in class, the same thing happened. Every day he would stand up and stumble and almost fall down because his feet would go numb. He was an old man. His feet would go numb and he would lose some sensation and then he would stand up and this big, he had this big copy of Muatta which is a size like your torso. He would hold it in his hand and almost fall and he would put his hand out like this and our class was a big U. So the student standing on both edges would quickly get up and go to him and they would put their hand out and he would lean against them, lift one foot, move it around a little to get some feeling in there. Then he would stop and lift the other foot and move it around a little to get some feeling in there and then he would leave the class. Every single day this would happen. So one day I said to him, in, in private, I said to him, Sheikh, why don't you just sit cross-legged or we can get you a chair? Like, it's completely cool. So he said two things. Number one, he said, Allah has given me the honor to teach Mu'atta Imam Malik. And Imam Malik would sit like this when he taught hadith too. So I wish to follow the sunnah of the author. Secondly, he said, we only have one example where Jibreel alayhi salam came to a gathering of hadith and this is how he sat too. فَأَسْنَدَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ إِلَىٰ رُكْبَتَيْهِ وَوَضَعَ كَفَّيْهِ عَلَىٰ فَخِذَيْهِ That when Jibreel alayhi salam showed up to the gathering of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he also sat like this. This is the only example we have in our history where an angel came to study hadith. And he said, following that legacy, I don't think it's appropriate for me to sit any other way. The feet will figure it out. But this adab cannot be, cannot be missed. 
These people were very particular about adab. And Hadith al-Jibreel, the first part of it, in reality, is all adab. It's all respect. How to be mindful of the teacher, how to dress when you go to a gathering, how to be appropriate, and so on. Now, before I continue, I just wanted to point out, this incident of Hadith al-Jibreel, it happened after Hajjat al -Wada. And I told you guys, when you think of Hajjat al what number should you, what number should you think of? 90. Always think of 90. Because that's how many days Rasulullah lived after Hajjat al Wada. Hajj ends on 12th of the Hijjah, he passed away on 12th of Rabiul Awwal. That's three months more or less than Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Safara wa raha min dunya. He left his temporary abode. So these are all incidents that happened after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, Mu'adh ibn Jabal was sent by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as an educator to Yemen. Both opinions are there. Some say it happened right before Hajjat al-Wada, while others say it happened after, before and after. Both opinions are there. Okay? Ala kulli hal, when Mu'adh ibn Jabal was ready to go to Yemen, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I'm sending you. He said, Hadr, I'm ready. He got his stuff ready. He prayed one last salah with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the masjid. And then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's habit was that he would walk his ambassadors and messengers to the outskirts of the city himself. Which is another adab. That when you have someone, when you're seeing someone off, if you have the ability, you should try to go to the port to see them off. People would do this with hajis back in the day. Before, you know, before airplanes came into existence, when people would go by ship. I didn't live that time, but I've read about it at least. That the community would go see the hujjaj off. That this was a, a, a caravan that was going to, uh, going for hajj. Um... Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was walking Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu an out. And as they were walking out, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to quiz him, to test him, to make sure he was ready for the task. So he asked him, Ya Mu'adh, bima tahkumu bayna nas When you go to Yemen, those people are Christians, keep that in mind, which means they're very good with scripture, they're very well-read people, they're intellectual, smart people. When they ask you a question, how will you answer them? So then he said, Ahkumu bi kitabillah. I will search for their answer in the Quran. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very happy and then said, Fa'illam tajid fi. What if you don't find the answer in the Quran? He didn't say, What if the answer isn't in the Quran? He said, What if you don't find it in the Quran? The language is important here, by the way. Okay, there's a nuance there for those of you who can appreciate it. So then he said, Fabi Sunnat al Rasul. Then I will look for the example and the answer where? In you, Ya Rasulullah, I've spent years with you, I'm your student, I will look for the answer in your, in your life. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَإِلَّمْ تَجِدْ What if you don't, still don't find it? So he said, أَجْتَهِدُ بِرَأْيِ وَلَا أَهْلُ O Messenger of Allah, I will use my intellect, I will find the answer based off of what I've learned in the Quran and Sunnah, and I won't fail you, O Messenger of Allah. I won't waste any energy, I will find the answer, inshaAllah. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he took his hand, and almost in joy and pride, being happy of him, he thumped him on the chest. And he said, Alhamdulillah, alladhi waffaqa rasoola rasoolillah. That I'll praise it for Allah who guided the messenger of the messenger of Allah. Meaning, you're good. Now if you're wondering where we're going with all of this, where, where are we headed with this whole lecture from the beginning till now, I was just preparing you for this last part. The whole thing leads to here. Now before I share this narration, Imam Nabawi rahmatullahi alayhi narrates this hadith in his 40 hadith collection. Imam Nawawi has a very famous 40 hadith collection. It's a must read for every Muslim. Because his 40 hadith collection covers the usul of the deen, the principles of the deen. Most of the narrations in there are authentic. Right? Those that are a little questionable, if you sit with a scholar, they can explain the reason why Imam Nawawi included those narrations. They can provide explanation to it. Alhamdulillah, I had the honor of teaching the Arba'in Nawawi some years back. And if anyone wishes to listen to it or benefit from it, it's uploaded on the Qalam podcast, which is a free listening um, service. Alhamdulillah, the Qalam instructors, they, uh, uh, we deliver weekly durus and we upload those lectures on the Qalam podcast. So on that podcast, we have thousands of hours of lectures and just weekly durus on there, which are fi sabirullah for the people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it and put it in our mizan hasanat. What I noticed was that Muslims in America don't have much connection with hadith. The only hadith they know is maybe one they heard in a khutbah or a lecture. No one's read hadith collections. I used to actually do this before. I would go to communities and I would ask them, who has read a hadith collection other than Arba'in Nawi? 
usually no one would raise their hands. And there would be hundreds of people sitting in the gathering, and I thought to myself, what in the world is going on here? How did we end up like this? There was a time in Muslim history, if you said, who read a hadith book and who has studied hadith, the whole ummah raised their hands. But today we're at a place where no one has done it. No one's studying. So that's why I started that journey of teaching hadith, um, the Arba'in Nawi class, and we uploaded it online, making dua to Allah that this becomes one of the means that people can use to build that relationship with hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now Imam Nawi narrates this hadith I'm going to share with you in his Arba'in. When he narrates it, he narrates it through two sahaba. He said, Anabi Dhar, Jundub ibn Junada al-Ghifari, wa Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhuma. That this hadith is narrated by two sahaba. Who are they? Abu Dhar radiallahu an, famous sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the second one is who? Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Are you guys with me? You're with me, right? You haven't lost me. Both of these people. Now when you study their narrations independently, he bunches them together, but obviously they narrated it separately, so you have two separate narrations here. When you study these narrations independently, when I taught the class, I did a hadith, I did a sanad uh, research to find the two chains and where they came from. The interesting thing is, both of the Sahaba have a different story of when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said these words to them. But the common thing is, both of them say these were the last words Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to us. Abu Dhar radiallahu anh says that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was his last advice to me. Mu'adh ibn Jabal says this was also the Prophet's last advice. Keep that in mind. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walks him out of Medina while asking him all these questions. The hadith is in Abu Dawud. This part of the hadith is in Abu Dawud. That he says that I mounted my animal and it was time for me to go. So I mounted my animal. I was facing south towards Yemen, getting ready to leave. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was just tightening up my luggage and just pulling some strings and making sure things were good. He was standing right under my saddle, right by my side. And he says, I noticed Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was crying. So I got off my animal and I said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, why are you crying? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, that O oh, Mu'adh, it's very possible that when you visit Medina, I won't be here, my grave will be here. So Mu'adh radiallahu anh realized that this was the, this was the wida, this was the farewell. He wouldn't see him again. Imagine what this meant for Mu'adh, this young teenager who was just probably goofing around like teenagers do. And then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa laid eyes on him. And loved him, mentored him, built him, gave him confidence, showed him a dream, walked him to that dream. And now he is this authority that Rasulullah has approved of. He's not just fake fake qualifications. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam approved of this man. And this is the end of the journey here. Now if it was me, I would probably say, O oh, Messenger of Allah, how about we put this Yemen thing on hold? We spend a few weeks together, we chill here, and Yemen ain't going anywhere. We'll go to Yemen later on. That's what anyone would say, right? Wouldn't you say that if that was your father or mother that was saying to you that this is our last meeting? But Muhammad ibn Jabal radiallahu understood that the greatest khidmah for Rasulullah wasn't sitting with him, it was teaching his deen. And if everyone sits in their comfort zone in Medina Munawwara, your equivalent, and decides to stay at home thinking that someone else would do it, it won't get done. Someone's going to have to leave their family. Someone's going to have to walk away from someone else that's crying. Right? Someone's going to have to leave the comfort of their home and travel. And we all do it anyway. We all do it for work, am I wrong? Every, every day at work, do we not get up and leave our comfort? When we leave our homes for work, we do. Some of us sit in trains, some of us sit in buses. We do this for the dunya. The question is, will we ever do this for the sake of the deen and our akhirah? That's the question I want to posit here first. Islam didn't reach New York and the corners of the world by coincidence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected His, his khas special servants who basically gave up everything for the sake of the deen. And we all know them because we saw them. We saw them growing up, that these were the elders in our community who put everything else on hold. One thing that amazes me about every masjid that I travel to in America is that we have boards. Is that right, guys? We, every masjid has a board, right? Like a president, vice president, and so on. One thing that amazes me, for those of you that are not on the board, I'm, I'm sure that you already know, but if you don't know, I'm going to share something with you that I think it amazes me. 
These people are volunteers. Honestly, ask yourself, do you think they don't have family? You don't think they have work? You don't think they have a house to take care of? They have all the headaches we have, yet somehow Allah has put it in their heart that go spend two hours in the masjid too. If you really think about this, it's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. Because in today's world, people don't do anything without getting... Hey, am I wrong? If I'm wrong, you guys tell me. No, that sh Shaykh, you're saying it wrong. This is not true. The, uh, my, my mind is puzzled. And it's not one masjid, alhamdulillah. Every masjid in America. And they don't do it for one or two months. How many months do they do it for? Four years, two years terms they're, they're, they're serving. Right? And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that tawfiq too. Right? I know that we all have our issues with board members and masajid across the world. Everyone's got something. All those issues aside, you have to appreciate someone's sacrifice. That this person is making a qurbani. This person is making a sacrifice, and that sacrifice cannot be neglected. Ala kulli hal, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu an realizes that he has to go. Yemen is where his destination is, and he will continue this journey. So now that he knows this is his final meeting with Rasulullah, he said to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Awsini, give me my final advice then. That hadith of Nawi, here it is now. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu for the last time in his life. And he said to him, Shukran, Jazakallah khairan. He said to him, Ya Mu'adh, O oh Mu'adh, Ittaqillah haythu ma kunt. Wherever you are, remember that Allah is with you. Be mindful of Allah, be conscious of Allah, be fearful of Allah. Whether you're at school, at work, at home, lights on or off, sitting in traffic, walking in the park, whether you're in Medina, Yemen, or New York, Ittaqillah haythu ma kunt. Keep your Allah close to you. Know that Allah is with you. Be conscious and mindful of Allah. This is the khulasa of it all. This is a summary of life. Remembering and keeping yourself in that constant thought that my Allah is with me. Shaitan's job is to make you forget the presence of Allah. Istahwada alayhim as shaitan fa ansahum Allah. When shaitan attacks people, the first thing he does is he makes them forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today when we were speaking to the younger folks in the school, this is the issue that we touched. Ghafla. That we live in a time of the all-time, this is the all-time records of ghafla. Everyone is distracted. So distracted. Check your phone and see how much time you spent on it. It's terrifying. Don't do it. The number is ridiculous. The average person spends like eight hours a day on their phone. I don't know if you guys heard that. Let me say it again, <laughs> in case it didn't hit you. The average person spends eight hours a day on their phone. If you spend eight hours a day on your phone, that means at the age of 60, you spent 20 years of your life on your phone. Because eight is one-third of 24, and 20 is one-third of 60. Basic fractions here, okay, guys? Right, this is level grade two. Slow <laughs> down. This is fourth grade stuff, okay, not second grade. This is fourth grade stuff, right? If you spend eight hours a day on your phone, and the other eight hours you spend sleeping, that means by the age of 60, you've only been awake for 20, for 20 years. And in those 20 years, what did you do? If you actually look at how much ibadah, maybe five minutes ibadah a day, it's probably a few hours in your life you spent worshipping Allah. How does that add up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's statement, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ How does that add up? Where Allah says that we created you for my worship. A few hours of my entire life I dedicated for your ibadah, sharam ki baadiyah. Wallahi, this is such a shame on myself. If it's too hard for me to direct it at you, I speak to myself. It's a shame on me. That only in my entire life I can dedicate a few hours of my entire existence on this planet to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mankind is distracted. And these distractions are not going anywhere. Zuckerberg's not going anywhere. He's trying to up his antics. From Facebook now he's going to? Metaverse. How do they come up with these names? Like, whoever thought Metaverse was a good idea? Mark. Mark. <laughs> he, thought it wasn't a good, he thought it was a good idea. Bismillah ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for the tea. Allah holds these people accountable too. 
Allah holds them accountable. I don't know if you guys watched, if you guys saw the news article where Facebook stock fell two weeks ago. Lucky pakar hai, dekho. They spent so much fitna and distracted people for so many years. I'm no one to celebrate anyone's loss, but 24% their stock fell in one day. How was it like $230 billion got wiped out in one day? 200 and, am I right? 230, 200, 220? 237? 237 billion with a B, if you didn't hear me again. With a what? B. Billion. Wiped out of one day. Bichara's own money, he lost $20 billion. And from his own personal net worth, he lost $20 billion in one day. Like that. These people have created a web of ghafla. They've created a sophisticated system that's all based on manipulation of the human psyche and forcing addictions onto people. This is no different from the crack addiction you know, that Americans had, and New York is the center, was the center of that, so you guys know the stories, right? That's, it's nothing less than that. They've just stopped using drugs, and now they're using what? They're using the human attention, and they're throwing social media at us, and they're just... And parents always say this, oh, my children are addicted to social media. Well, the adults are the same. How many hours do you spend on WhatsApp? How many messages do you forward? How many messages do you listen to? But WhatsApp's not social media. Well, guess who owns WhatsApp? Facebook, Meta, Zuckerberg owns it. And Zuckerberg is only in social media business. So next time you open up WhatsApp, you need to know you are on Zuckerberg's platform again. You're on that guy's platform. I have no issue against a person per se. But I do have an issue against people who manipulate other human beings intentionally. When he was called to the Senate hearings, and they said to him, you intentionally, your organization intentionally pushed ads at early teenage females about health image, about diet pills and just these, uh, you know, like we live in a world of just health image where they were pushing pictures of unrealistic bodies at young girls, which you knew caused suicide and depression in young early teen girls, 13, 14 year old girls. And yet you continue to do it. Facebook ran the report themselves. They had an independent team of their own do a research on this, and even in their results, it was, that's where all these whistleblowers came from. You know why the Senate hearing happened, right? Because after that report was produced by, internally produced, and, and their own staff saw that these stats could not be de neglected, that the organization, the, in their, their company was inducing depression in young girls and leading them to suicide, and they couldn't stay quiet about it anymore. So they all came out whistleblowers, and they all began to complain about it. So. They said, how are you going to solve this? So the guy says that, you know, the problem was called, the problem was caused by their algorithms because their algorithms only push extreme content, right? Um, so he said that we're going to create new algorithms. A problem caused by algorithms, how is he going to solve it? More algorithms. Uh, I won't touch this issue any further. I'm going to go back to the hadith because this is a dark hole and I don't want to spend this night talking about dark things. I'm going to talk about hadith. Um, but I will give you a reference. For those of you who have access to the Netflix uh, platform, if you have a Netflix account or if you know someone that has a Netflix account, there is a very important documentary you must watch. I didn't say you should watch it. Keep in mind, okay? What did I say? You, you have to watch it. And even better, watch it with your family. I, we do a movie night at my house every Saturday. I sit with the kids and we watch something. And I usually carefully spend the week selecting what I'm going to watch with them. I don't watch garbage cartoon stuff. We usually, I usually find something that's thought-provoking. And we watch the, this documentary together. It's called The Social Dilemma. Anyone here seen it? Maybe, yeah? You've seen it? Oh my goodness, it is genius. It is amazing, The Social Dilemma. It is an absolute must-watch. Once you watch that, it's only an hour, an hour and some. It's not long. We spend more time on that doing garbage anyway. Watching that documentary will show you how corruptive, how destructive these technologies actually are. Right? It's, uh, it's truly phenomenal. At the end of it, and I can talk about this for a long time, but I won't. At the end of it, at the end of the documentary, he says that if we continue the path that we're on, if these guys don't adjust their algorithms, a civil war in America is eminent. The reason is because these algorithms only push content to people that will, that will pique their interest. 
And people are not interested in the middle, they're interested in extremes. So the more they read those articles, the further they go. The middle area in American politics, in American society, is disappearing. And with time, the extremes are becoming more bold and more bold and more bold. And a time comes where people can't take it anymore. And therefore, they choose to hurt each other. May Allah protect us and safeguard our community and our nation and our people, all of us, jami'an, inshallah. We live in a time of great ghafla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مُعْرِضُونَ مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ ذِكْرٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ مُحْدَثٍ إِلَّا اسْتَمَعُوهُ وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ لَاهِيَةً قُلُوبُهُمْ That as the Day of Judgment approaches, اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ The Day of Judgment has come. وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مُعْرِضُونَ While they're still watching their shows and playing their games and wasting time. مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ ذِكْرٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ مُحْدَثٍ إِلَّا اسْتَمَعُوهُ وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ While revelation is coming to him and while they hear this message, they're still goofing around. لَاهِيَةٌ قُلُوبُهُمْ Hearts are distracted. People have lost focus. Our entire life is kind of like a person taking a picture with a DSLR and the whole thing's out of focus. Everything's very blurry. Whatever people tell us to do, we do it. Revelation gets rid of that blur and makes everything crisp and clear. It's clean. It cleans it all up. It clear, gets rid of all the extra noise in the image. Focus. This is what revelation does. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Ma'ad, Ittaqillah haythu ma'kunt. Be mindful of Allah wherever you are. وَأَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُهَا Follow up your bad deeds with good deeds, for it'll erase it. We all are going to make mistakes. Anyone that says they don't is lying. They're not being honest with you. After the Anbiya alayhim was salam, no human being is ma'asum. The Anbiya were ma'asum, they were protected by Allah. Ismatul Anbiya is a central belief of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. It's an issue we believe firmly in that Anbiya alayhim was salam did not commit sins. So all these Judo-Christian traditions that we have that say that so-and-so Nabi did this haram and so-and-so Nabi did that haram, we said all these people, you're liars. These are all iftira. They're all made up. Our policy is Al-Anbiya Ma'asum that the Anbiya alayhim salam are protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After the Anbiya alayhim salam, every human being makes mistakes. Every human being does. That doesn't make them bad, it just makes them a human. That's what it is. Kullu bani adam a khatta. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointed out that all human beings make mistakes. Wa khayr al-khatta'in at-tawabun. But the best of those who make mistakes are those who repent to Allah. They, they're quick to mending, fixing problems. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that no matter how conscious you try to be of Allah, you and I are always going to make mistakes. But when you make mistakes, don't just be okay with making the mistake. Don't be okay with sin being a part of your life. Don't get used to it. Protest against your own self and do a good deed. Stand up against your own self. Do a good deed. فَإِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيَّاتِ Allah Azza wa says, good deeds erase bad deeds. That's the barakah of a'mal saliha, good deeds, that they erase your sins. The nafs of the human being, the lower self of the human being, is where shaitan does all his waswasa. This is where shaitan whispers. And these were all these dark, evil thoughts come onto the self. And therefore the human being disobeys Allah and falls into the shackles of shaitan. And we keep doing this again and again, until the point comes that many of us don't even know what it feels like living a life without shaitan's influence. We don't know what that feels like. We've never had any other way. That's just it. We've never come out of it. The Qur'an is constantly teaching us how to get out of those shackles of shaitan. And until you don't get out, you'll never know. It's like a person who's locked in a room and they don't know there's a world outside it. Right? Like the fish in the ocean. They don't know what it means to scale Everest. They have no idea that avarice even exists because they're locked in their dunya. And their dunya is the ocean. We are locked, we are locked in the shackles of shaitan, unfortunately. And the only way out of this is for us to begin to feel again. When you sin, you should at least have a little regret, a little remorse. 
You should feel it. If someone takes a dagger and stabs you and you don't feel anything, is that a good sign or a bad sign? Huh, folks? It's a really bad sign. Why is that? Because Allah has, there's, literally, there's nerve damage. Allah has placed nerves in you which allow you to feel sensation, right? And therefore, you protect yourself. So when someone pokes you, you say, ow, and you pull your hand back. That's what, that's what a human being should be. That if you, make, if you commit a sin, if you fall, you should immediately say, ow, astaghfirullah. Like, I shouldn't have done that. The fact is right now, shaitan is just digging that dagger in, and he's turning it, and he's twisting it, and he's doing all sorts, and the insan doesn't feel anything at all. We must learn to feel pain internally for the wrong that we do. There was this young man that I dealt with. It's a long story. I won't share the details with you guys. It was a marital issue. There was a conflict in the marriage. The wife complained and she said that I found my husband looking at certain things that are inappropriate. I'm not going to go beyond that. You guys can read it in between the lines. And she was very hurt by this. So she sat him in front of me. I sat with him and before I gave him any nasiha or anything, I asked him, why? Why are you doing this? What happened next really opened up my eyes. He started crying and he cried and cried and cried. He said, Sheikh, you think I enjoy sinning? Wallahi, I don't. He said, by Allah, if I could give all of my wealth right now that I possess to get rid of this one addiction, I would do it right now. Unfortunately, I made the wrong mistake when I was young and I got addicted. I'm not happy about this. I'm shameful. It hurts me. He said, every time I commit the sin, I cry and I cry for the whole day and then when I think about it, it hurts me even more. It eats me up from within. And he was just crying the entire time. He said, I know that my sins are going to make a ruin out of me in life. So I gave him some nasiha, but at the end of it, right before he left the office, I said to him, this right here, this regret and remorse you feel, never let go of it. This guilt that you feel of disobeying Allah, never let go of it. I said, if you hold on to this, my heart says one day you will become a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes the regret and the remorse of a sinner much more than the arrogance of a worshiper. When a person sins, it keeps them humble too. I'm not saying people should go sin, but it happens. When it happens, it makes you realize, man, I'm messed up. It keeps you humble. The problem is, many of us sin and we don't recognize it. So we become uh, ignorant of what we're doing. It's a very peculiar, weird situation. You have to have i'tiraf. That I did something wrong, my bad. Right? That was wrong on me. Today, earlier, we were talking about parenting. I say to my children all the time at home, that look, Beta, as a parent, I have to be firm with you sometimes. If I'm ever firm with you and you feel that I went too far, you have every right to come and tell me. Every right. You have to right. You have haq. I'm giving you that right. You have a right to come and tell me. The only thing I say to you is when you talk to me, make sure you speak with adab. Don't come and raise your voice when you talk to me. Nicely present your case. And if I'm convinced that you're right, I promise I will apologize to you. Then it happens all the time. I'm a human being. We're all human beings. We all go too far sometimes. One time I was punishing one of my sons and the older one came to me and he said, Abba, you're gone too far. This was unnecessary. He said it in a nice way with other. Then I gave it some thought and I said, you're right. I'll apologize to him. We have to be able to do i'tiraf in our own houses, in our own work, that we can say that, no, buddy, I was wrong here, or, no, I was right. Sometimes you might be firm and say, no, I'm right, you're wrong here. Either way, you have to have honesty. So here, we, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him, when you do something wrong, follow it up with a good deed. أَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُوهَا Follow it up with a good deed, it'll wipe it out. The last part of the hadith, and with this we'll close off today's session too. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَخَالِقِ النَّاسِ بِخُلُقٍ حَسَنٍ Socialize, interact with people with good character. Be a good human. Keep in mind, he's sending him to Yemen, right? And he knows that Mu'adh is a smart guy. So as far as textual arguments go, if let's say someone objects to Mu'adh, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is confident that Mu'adh will overpower that person. That's not the issue. 
But Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is telling him, don't let your knowledge become a reason for being disrespectful though. Have good adab, have good ihtiram. People are rarely convinced by knowledge, they are very easily convinced by good character. All of us have had an experience like this in our life. I'm sure of it. That at some point in our life, someone said or did something with adab and ihtiram, and we appreciated it so much. That person's kindness changed our words. Changed our life, sorry. Right? Have good akhlaq. Socialize with people in a good way. Learn to smile. Lower your voice when you talk to other people. Be considerate and mindful of other people. Don't just live a selfish life, live a selfless life. Because that's who Rasulullah was. I talked about this at the beginning of the session. I think we're going to end here too. Adab and ihtiram. We covered, a, you know how I said every Tuesday we do a class, we did the Arba'in Nawi. The class we just finished right now was, uh, was on this subject. Shaykh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda ta'ala wrote another book called Min Adab al-Islam. So we covered that, it's on the Qalam podcast too if anyone wants to benefit from it. Uh, we did a whole class on Islamic manners. That what are proper, appropriate, suitable manners of how to conduct yourself in society. How to be a good Muslim. These things are important, you have to learn them. The Arabic poet says, أَدِّبُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ أَيُّهَا الْأَصْحَابُ تُرُكَ الْعُشْكُ كُلُّهَا آدَابُ That all my companions have good manners. Because every path of love is built off of good manners. تُرُكَ الْعُشْكُ The path of love is all, all paths of love. كُلُّهَا آدَابُ They're all based off of good manners. You can't claim to love someone if you don't have good etiquette. If you don't have good manners. If you're not respectful to that person. Have good character. You know, if you have to, like, you know, like, Muslims should be able to see, non-Muslims should be able to see the beauty in Islam just through experiencing a Muslim. You shouldn't have to even give da'wah to Islam. You shouldn't have to say, I'm a Muslim. Let them see the Islam. You, don't, you shouldn't have to even say it. Let them see what a Muslim is, what kind of person a Muslim is. Let them experience that. Let their hearts melt through just interacting with you. But cutting off people on the road when you're driving, Double parking like we talked about on Jummah. This is very shameful. I'm hoping that what he was saying is not true, but when I heard this, I was thinking to myself, wala hawla wala quwata illa billah. This is, you know, it's, I know that we're, we're like, oh, it's not a big deal. No, it's not. It's a big deal. You know societally how frowned upon of an action that is? You know how selfish of an act double parking is? You know how selfish that is? That's so selfish. And that goes against everything Rasulullah spent his life doing. If someone asked me, summarize Nabi in one word, first thing I would say, can't do it. But if I really had to, I would choose the word selfless. That would be the word that I would choose. That I think Nabi was a self, that's the one word that sticks out to me. That he put himself at the back of the line and gave everyone else preference. The shawahid and proofs of these are too many to share in one lecture. His books, you can write books on it, not one volume you can write on. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, athar al khalq ala hayatihi, where he gave preference to the whole world upon his life. Everyone, give everyone preference. Everyone preference. Um, I, I kid you not, there are so many examples, you can write books on this. And Muslims are selfish like this, where people say that I went to the Muslim store and they cheated me. Astaghfirullah. Look, if you can't say a good word about Islam, at least don't give it a bad image. Isn't that the bare minimum? But today the Muslim is not even trying to give a good image of Islam. We're going the opposite way and telling everyone how bad we are as people. Among Muslims there is an understanding, don't deal with another Muslim, you'll get cheated. Sharam ki baat hai. We as a nation should feel ashamed of ourselves. That this is where we are. If I were to ask, and don't, don't raise your hand, but if I were to ask how many of you have been cheated by one of your Muslim brothers, I fear that everyone's going to raise their hands, including myself. This shouldn't happen. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, uh, the munafiq, إِذَا تُمِنَ khan, إِذَا wa'ada akhlaf." The believer doesn't cheat people, doesn't betray people. The believer is truthful. Even if it means you lose out in the dunya, that's okay. You don't lie to people, you don't cheat people. You have good character. The parent today that is shouting at their child and abusing their child like we talked about in khutbah, what do you think that child is going to do when they grow up? Huh? Same thing. What goes around comes around. It's just a cycle. This cycle has to be broken through people coming forth and saying that I will live by a higher standard 
and I will live by good akhlaq. The Urdu poet said, Husn kirdar se nure mujassam ho ja. Husn kirdar se nure mujassam ho ja. Embody in yourself the light of good character. Ki iblis pe tujhe dekhe to musalma ho jaye. That even if the devil himself were to see you, he'd want to become Muslim. That should be your character. And today, Muslims are running away from Muslims because of the character that we have. It has to stop. This has to stop. And I'm not sure if any lecturer is going to do it. I'm not sure if any talk is going to do it because I know for a fact that this is not the first time you've heard this in your life. Your parents have told you this. Your family has told you this. Your khatib has told you this. The only way this cycle changes is if human beings understand as individuals. Every person sitting here understands that if I could fix my character, my immediate life will change. Your immediate life will change right away. Half of the divorces we have, gone, canceled. I'm telling you. So many of these suicide cases we have, canceled, gone. They'd go disappear. If people can understand that good character, not only does it create a greater society, it creates a better quality of life for you. When you are nice to people, what are people going to do? Huh, folks? If you're nice to people, they're going to be nice to you, right? Is that a fair statement? Would you guys agree? If you're kind to people, if Imam Abdul Ghani is nice to people, no one's going to be harsh with them. They're going to be kind to him. Because they re they've experienced kindness, so they're going to reciprocate by being kind back. Good begets good. Right? And evil begets e evil. It, there's a value that comes into our lives and everyone else around us. We have to embody good character in, ourse in ourselves. And then go out. And people will see it. They'll see it very quick. They're smart. You know, Muslim, there are so many cases, historical cases, where entire communities were influenced to accept Islam by the character of one person. People, they say, it was not anymore. These days they don't say it anymore. But like in the 80s and 90s, one of the big Orientalist arguments, Orientalists is referred to like the academic uh, the non-Muslim academic body that's generally critical of Muslims, but not always, you know, like the guys sitting in professors, as professors in universities. So one of the most common arguments Orientalists used to make about Islam before, in the 80s and 90s, was that Islam was spread by the power of the sword. You guys heard of that before? Yeah. That Islam was spread by the power of the... What that means is that Muslim, every, the Prophet ﷺ took his sword out and said, Muslim, no Muslim. He said, no Muslim. He knocked his head off. Muslim, no Muslim, Muslim, okay, you can come live. That's the sort of picture they, they draw. That, that's such, an, such a silly claim. It's such a silly claim that you don't even know where to start with it, right? But it also makes you happy that they got it so wrong because they can't even fathom the truth being real. And we know as Muslims that that's what actually what happened. Nabi Sallallahu didn't win their hearts of people through sword. He won it through what? Through his kindness. And again, another thing that we can write a book on. Another old, this is not a, I can't give one or two examples. Well, I'll tell you this much. The ayah of jihad for permission, for fighting, by the way, the first ayah revealed was the ayah, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا The first ayah revealed, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ so The first ayah revealed in this regard is this ayah of Surah uh, Hajj, I believe it is, or Anbiya, Surah Hajj. And this was revealed after in Medina Munawwara. So for the first 13 years of Islam, Muslims were not even given permission by Allah to fight. You guys understand this? And if you say to me that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forced everyone into Islam, do you think there was any sword that could have put fear into Khalid bin Walid's heart to become Muslim? For those of you who don't know, Khalid bin Walid was a courageous, powerful, strong general. Some claim that his record was undefeated. Right? You think Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, anyone could force him to do something? Or Umar radiallahu anh could be forced that, you know what? You, you know. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he won people's hearts through his smile, through his character, what kind of person he was. His salam, when, when people, the Sahaba actually described this, that saying salam to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a whole experience that he would commit to the handshake. Ibn Masood says in Bukhari, that my one hand was in between the two hands of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he would greet us, he would smile at us. He would be the first to initiate the salam. He would keep his hands there until we decided to withdraw. He wouldn't turn his head like this and say salam. He would turn his whole body to that person. 
giving that person its undivided attention, giving that person salam. It was a whole experience, right? That how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam treated people, how he was kind to them. So I conclude here. I wanted to share this narration of Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. It's such a jami'ah, concise narration with so many great lessons of life. To summarize it just for our memory, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, the last time he met the Prophet of Allah, he asked him, O Messenger of Allah, advise me, O Sini. To that, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him three pieces of advice. The first thing he said was, Ittaqillah haythu ma kunt. What does that mean, folks? You guys translate it for me. Even if it's not an accurate translation, but what, what was the first point? Fear Allah Yeah. I think instead of fear Allah, we should say be, be conscious of Allah. A better translation of taqwa is what, guys? I'm not saying we shouldn't fear Allah. The Quran does say, وَخْشَوْنِي So that's right. But in the word taqwa, the more correct translation to it is to be aware. It comes from the Arabic word waqa yaqi wiqayatan, which means to hold back. When we make dua to Allah, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana, what's the next part? Baqi. You see the word qi there? That's actually a word, it's not a letter. It's a whole word. That word qi is amr, which means protect. It's a command. Protect. Qina means protect us. Adab and not from the fire of hell. It's from that same word. When Umar radiallahu anh asked Ubayy ibn Ka'ab, what is taqwa? He asked him, what does taqwa mean? So you know the example he gave him? He said, imagine a person walking on a narrow path that's full of thorns. When he walks on it, he said, how will he walk? So Umar radiallahu anh said he will lift his garment to make sure his view is clear. He'll carefully place his foot in the places where there, where there are no thorns. He said, that's taqwa right there. Awareness, alertness, to be conscious. As opposed to fear, which has a... By the way, fearing Allah is a good thing. But it's a whole different thing itself. This, it's not, I, don't, I don't think the translation of taqwa should be fear Allah. But yes, be mindful of Allah. Number two, what was the second thing? Atbi'i sayyat al hasanat tamhuha. Follow up your sins with a good deed. Tamhuha. What did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? It'll, it'll clear up, it'll erase it. And the last thing, khaliq al nas bi khuluq al hasan. What is this thing? Good character. I'll share one last line of poetry. Mirza Asadullah Ghalib, the famous Mughal poet, he said. He's talking about this idea where everyone, the reason, he says the reason why people don't improve themselves is because they say, why should I improve if that guy's messed up? If I become better, then everyone's going to abuse me. That's the mindset, right? That we'll fix other people first, then we'll fix ourselves later. So Ghalib, he, he addresses this issue in one line of poetry where he says, Umar bar yun hi ghalti karte rehe ghalib dhul chehre par thi hum aayna saaf karte rehe That oh ghalib you made the same mistake your entire life Your face was dirty but you kept cleaning the mirror Thinking somehow if you clean the mirror your face will get clean Dhul chehre par thi hum aayna saaf karte rehe Hakikat to ye ke The reality is you have to wash your, you have to clean your own face And then the mirror there, there was no problem with the mirror It was accepting yourself May Allah grant us tawfiq وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. If we have any questions, we could take one or two. If anyone has anything pressing, otherwise we'll lead it to Imam Abdul Ghani to guide us on what's next. Doesn't seem like anyone has any questions. That's good news for me. I dread Q and A's. The issue is that I'm a long-winded person. I don't know how to say yes or no. <laughs> so when someone asks me a question, it takes 15 minutes to answer it. So, but if anyone does have one, inshallah, I'll try my best. One little one, which is what you have when you talk about, it's about the diversity and how we accept each other. And especially like you're talking about the madahib and the differences and how sometimes we become very tense. If you can just, you know, Oh gosh, this is like a fool. <laughs> that's a, yeah. Okay, let me try. Let me try. In Islam, we thrive for unity, not uniformity. This is important. We thrive for what, guys? Unity, not. What's the second word I used? Uniformity. uniformity. What's the difference between the two? What does unity mean? to be together, to be one team, to be united. Uniformity means? Like imagine um, everyone was your point guard. 
how bad would that team be? You guys understand? Imagine everyone was a quarterback. That's uniformity, right? We don't want everyone doing the same thing. We need people to come with their diversity. Come with your differences. Islam will teach you to work together no matter how different you are. Accomplishing uniformity, specifically when it comes to Islamic law, is an unrealistic expectation. And not only that, it's one that goes against the essence of Islam itself. Is that clear? You know this whole thing that everyone needs to follow one madhab, the whole ummah needs to follow one madhab and that's it. It sounds really good on paper, but it goes against everything that Islam believes in. Because if this was a goal that was desirable, the Sahaba would have done it for us. Is that clear, guys? If this was a desirable goal, what would have happened? The Sahaba would have solved it for us. They were, I mean, they were the, the direct students of Rasulullah wasallam, But they celebrated their differences. They celebrated it. Rasulullah never demanded uniformity. Common, uh, um, great example. Umar radiallahu an, one day, he was sitting and he heard Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu an recite in the Quran. Umar radiallahu an knew the verse, memory, he had it memorized which verse he was reciting. So immediately he grabbed him by his collar and took him to Rasulullah He said, oh Messenger of Allah, I heard him reading the verse of the Qur'an and he read it wrong. And when I confronted him, he said that this was the right way. But I heard you teach me this verse and it was this way. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Ubayy ibn Ka'ab, Iqra alayya, read for me. So he read it. Then he said to Umar radiallahu an, read for me. He read it. What did Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? Kilahuma sawab. They're both correct. Unzir al Qur'ana ala sabahati aharuf. Nabi saw something clarified that there are multiple recitations to the Qur'an. This uniformity is not a matloop thing. We don't have it in our in our in, in our in our qira'ah of the Qur'an. We don't have it in our fiqh. We don't have it in the, Muslims celebrated their diversity. Now Muslim scholars, so that's first thing. Number one. Number two. It is a responsibility of Muslim scholars to engage in that diversity, not the common person. So, which opinion is correct, which opinion is wrong, whether we should choose this opinion, that opinion, that's not the responsibility of the common folk, it's the responsibility of who? The ulama. Because they dedicated their life to it. When, and, and, when someone who hasn't studied the deen says that, in my opinion, this is what should happen, I almost feel so offended, not almost, I definitely feel very offended by it. Because I think to myself, there is no discipline in the world where an outsider can come and say, this is my opinion, and that opinion have any weight at all. Bichara Muslim Islam is this yatim religion that nobody cares about. You come and give roti too for this iman. Bichara Islam is faqir gharib. Islam, faith that you know, you can come and say whatever you want. You don't have to have any qualifications. I say to my students at the seminary, Muslim scholars have never bullied people out of having an opinion. Right? If... This person said that I want to have an opinion in, in, in Islamic rulings. You know what I would say to him? Ahlan, welcome. But you have to go do these things first. It's going to take you seven, eight years to do it. Once you're done with it, come back, we can have a discussion. So no one is saying you can't do it. What are we saying though? You need to speak from a place of knowledge. You can't just make up stuff. It's disastrous. It's devastating. If you want to know what happens when non-scholars speak about a faith if you want to know what happens look at Christianity the Christian experience for Muslims in America is a big one their scholars and seminaries were one part of society and then there was the rest of the Christian community that was involved with political engagement and in activism the people whose word mattered more in representing the faith unfortunately were the activists and the these political uh, figures. So when you fast forward now a few decades, Christianity has become a joke of a religion. It doesn't mean anything. The people within the faith don't take it seriously. What does it mean to be a practicing Christian? I mean, I live in Texas, so I have an idea of what it means because I live in Texas. But when I was in Chicago, I had no idea what it meant. I didn't know what a practicing Christian was. There was no, there was no example of it. Every likulli fanyan rijal. For every subject matter, for every discipline, there are specialists 
And for Islam, there are specialists too. Okay, so we knock that out. First thing, diversity is a necessity for human beings. Number two, you want to be a part of that discussion, that technical discussion, you have to have the right qualifications. Number three, see the issue isn't with having multiple opinions. The issue is when you lose respect and you become uh, disrespectful when engaging with someone who differs in opinion with you. Are you, are you, guys, are you guys following me here? Right? It's actually healthy. It's very important that you have a position with someone. Like, I try to do this with my kids at home. I actually want them to have different positions than me on issues and tell them that we can still get along. Because many children, when they grow up, they think the only way is to have the exact same position as that person. We aren't empowering them. You know, for example, I'll, I'll say to my son that, you know what, I'm going to, um, um, for example, I'm going to broom the kitchen or mop the kitchen. So I'll do it. Then I'll say, he'll say, Abba, you did it like this. I think this would be a better way to do, do, mop it. You know, there are different techniques of mopping and brooming, right? So I would say to him, do, do what you feel right. It's a, it doesn't have any consequence. This is an inconsequential thing. You know, you have one way, I have another way. It's completely okay. You don't have to become a copy of me. Actually, I don't want that. This copy is not good. This needs to be much better. So let's deviate from this a little bit and focus on that. Okay? We have to learn to be comfortable. This not embracing our richness in tradition and the different madahib, not embracing this is a big loss of our own. We are losing out. Because we're flushing away the richness of Islam. How rich this deen actually is. How broad it actually is. People say to me, I don't know if I should say this. Actually, leave it. We won't do it. Because it's just a, another discussion. It'll, it'll get longer. Khulasa is, to answer our dear Imam's point, we need to embrace diversity. Many of us have grown up in homogenous societies where it was only Hanafis, only Malikis, only Shafi'is, only whatever it was, right? And then now when we come to the community and we see one person praying Salah one way, another person praying another way, we get very offended. And then we start asking our own scholars, so what do you say about wiping on cotton socks? He says, haram. Hey, what do you say about wiping on cotton socks? It's jayas. We go to our imam and say, but that imam said that you can't pray Salah if you wiped on cotton socks. And they're causing fitna. Do you guys understand? What are these people doing? They're causing fitna. They say, okay, so you know, from now on, we're not going to pray behind you if you wipe on your cotton socks. We're going to have our second jama'ah there. Is this what we're doing now? Is this what we're doing? That you know, someone holds another position, whether we agree with it or not. We can't just walk away from each other. What's going to happen to this ummah? I go to the Haram Makkah, and I'm saying this as someone who follows the Hanafi Madhab, and I'm very familiar with Hanafi Islamic law. Very familiar with it. I'm not, I'm not bragging here. I'm just saying it because someone may say, oh, who are you to say this? I go to the Haram in Makkah Makaramah, specifically in Ramadan, it's with their time and people are walking away from the masjid. Because in the Hanafi Madhab, when you pray with it, you pray all three two together. In Haramain, sometimes what they do is that they pray two and one, and sometimes they do three all together. I wish the Imam of Haram was accommodating. I really wish that. Right? Because they're responsible of the biggest congregation. And that, that, that's your responsibility, if you ask me that. Right? Not that my opinion matters, but I'm just being, that's how I feel. Right? Uh, I, I follow the Hanafi Madhab. Yet, I understand that According to the Shafi'i Madhab, if I touch my wife, my wudu breaks, so I do wudu anyway. Because my job is to accommodate my everyone. To make sure everyone's happy. Ala kulli hal, you have these people walking out of the masjid. I asked one guy, I said, where are you going? He's starting with their salah. Only a munafiq walks away from salah. It's happening. He says, well, according to our madhab, this salah doesn't count. I know there's a conundrum here. I understand that there is a legitimate conundrum here. Which is that one madhab says it doesn't count, the other one says it does. Look, you don't walk away from something Muslims do as a community. You don't walk away from the jama'ah. In that moment, put your opinion on the side. Follow your imam. Follow your community leader. This is an example of where madahib caused division. We never want to cause division in our ummah. As Muslims, we are already a minority living in the West. Is that, re is that right? So when people see you on the train or bus and they have something, some weird slur to say, do, you, do they care what madhab you're following? Yes or no? They don't care. What was that? <laughs> you're dangerous. <laughs> dangerous person. He's right. But anyway, another time. 
They don't care, right? For you, for the, they're a Muslim. Now, when the, the kid, he's getting bullied at school for being Muslim, then he comes to the masjid, he's getting bullied for being Hanafi or being Shafi'i. Bichara, he must think, man, when is it all going to stop? Why can't I just be a Muslim? I'm not saying abandon the madhahib. I am a very big uh, supporter of this. I think this is very important that we have schools of thoughts. It's a tradition that's existed for a thousand years that's based on pure academic research. Anyone that says the madhahib are all made up and they're hoof poof is an absolute jahil. Because the number of pages Muslim jurists have written on Islamic law is phenomenal. Alhamdulillah, I teach Islamic law at the seminary. So I'm quite familiar with this discussion too. Okay? We don't need to throw it away. I can be a Hanafi and this brother here can be a Shafi'i, but if he's leading Salah, you lead, man. I'm following you. You're my brother in Islam. And if I'm leading, I hope that... What? You do the same thing. When we're praying Salah alone, you pray as you were taught and I'm going to pray as I was taught. There's no need for any conversion therapy to happen here. <laughs> if you guys understand what I'm saying. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, is that okay, Imam? Anything you'd like to add to that? Good? Okay, folks, with that, we'll wrap it up. Yes, you had a question? Yeah, um, I heard you taught a course on how to give da'wah in nine minutes. Is that you got someone else on that one. I don't think I'd covered that before. Allah How to give da'wah in nine minutes. I don't think I can do that. <laughs> I'm not capable of that. I'm not going to lie to you. Because I can't answer a question in five minutes. I'm a long-winded person, so that would be very hypocritical. If I did cover that, don't listen to me. <laughs> um, I don't. Maybe, maybe someone else who may have covered it. Someone more eloquent and more concise in words. Really? Yeah. Well, I'm <laughs> I do have a funny story with a security guard in Chicago, by the way. There was one brother who accepted Islam. That's another story, though. <laughs> Yes. My question is how to make victims punctual in Salat. Uh, ask them what is the difference between culture, Islam, and Islam. How to bring big kids to Masjid is another question. How to make kids marry in an early age. That's it. You get my I'm not going to try. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer these questions. Which now, be because it's too much. Each of these are very. You choose one for me. You choose one, and I'll try. Is there one that you prefer? There was one on marriage, one on salah, and there was a. Th <coughs> you guys tell me one, and I'll try. It's just a question. Yeah. So the first thing we got to do is stop calling them kids. That's the first thing we got to do. I'm telling you, man. We need to stop using the word youth and kids. These two words are badly overused and they're not, they're not appropriate. I'm not saying linguistically they're not correct. I understand. I speak English language and I understand what they represent. It's just the wrong mindset. Look, when you're talking to an 18-year-old son of yours that you're calling an old kid, let's run that scenario, okay? that you have an 18-year-old son and you're like, how do I figure it out? You have to stop thinking of him as a kid and you need to stop thinking of him as an, as an adult, as a man. This is an adult. So now the question is, how do I get an adult to come to the masjid? That's more relatable to yourself. The problem is parents aren't willing, even elders in our community aren't willing to appreciate that many of the people that we're calling youth and kids are actually, they're adults. In Islam, we have bulugh and ghair bulugh. That's it. Either you're mature or you're not mature. Once you've hit puberty, you are now mature, you are now mukallaf, you're accountable with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a whole different game. There is a statement that's attributed to Ali radiallahu anhu. I don't think it's authentically attributed to him, by the way. And that's another thing to hold out. Whenever someone says Ali radiallahu anhu said something, you have to like almost hit the brakes. <laughs> because I, think, I don't know if there's any person that has so many false attributions to him, like Ali radiallahu anhu. Which Arab and they have so many fabricated fabrications attributed. So just that's why I'm telling you right now. It's attributed to him. I myself am very skeptical. I've seen Ghazali write something similar, and I think that's more correct. 
that maybe one of the ulama after came up with this theory or this proposal. It's a proposal on parenting. I've adopted, and this is like my, 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 my game plan is based off of this, this, this hidayah, this guidance. Where the, the whole thing is that parenting is based off of three stages. Saba, saba, saba. Seven years, seven years, and seven years. Do you guys understand? La'ibuhum mm saban. -hmm. Number one, the first seven years. The first seven years are for love and play. That's it. Your job in the first seven years of your child's life is to just love them. Show them you love them. Be there for them. Let them play. In the West, I, you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf visited our masjid um, last week or the week before recently, and we had a conversation with him, myself, Sheikh Abdul Nasser and him, we had a panel discussion, and we talked about Islamic education. It was just a very, it was an insightful discussion. One of the things that he said, and I agree with him, is that in America, we push education on children too early. And it seems as if we aren't so interested in their education as much as we are looking for free daycare. Because we want more people working, we want more productivity, we've already put the mothers in the workplace, we put the dads in the workplace, so we need free daycare. So at pre-K 4 it starts, pre-K pre -K 3 or 4, where does it start? Pre-K 2? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm not kidding, someone probably came up with that idea, right? At pre-K 3 it starts. And, you know, the cumulative knowledge that children gain in those first three, four years at school is minimal, if anything. Yes, they learn social skills, but the reason why they have to go to school to learn those social skills is because we killed the social part of society by putting everyone in their homes and creating an individual society. We created a problem by creating an individualistic society. America, okay, let's get this out of the way. This society is what, guys? It's a society based off of individualism. I'm telling you straight. In my masjid this last Friday, I gave a khutbah and I said a statement there. One of the brothers didn't like it. But I said to him, look, brother, I, I, I believe in it. I said to him, most masajid in America are not building communities. It's not because they're not trying. They're trying very hard, actually. Let's do iftar, let's do outing, let's do some barbecue, let's do community halaqa, let's do a dinner. The problem is that the reason why we're not successful in building societies is because we're failing to understand one thing, that American, the American setting, you know, the settings for every American, is default on individualism. So what happens is we turn communal places not into places where we build, where we build community, communal community. We use communal places for individual purposes and we leave. Someone can go to the mall, spend three hours there and not talk to another person other than the person they're buying and selling from. Does that happen? Is the mall a communal place? Do you interact with the community while you're there? No. People come to the masjid for years. Namaz padke nikal jate. They pray salah and they leave. Have they talked to anyone? While they're putting their shoes on, they're looking at the other guy eye to eye. He's putting his shoes on, you're putting your shoe on. And it's so awkward, but no one says salamu alaikum. I'm telling you, our communal places are unfortunately now being used for individual purposes. We have to break out of this. And there is a system of breaking out. The system of breaking out of this is afshu salam, at'imu ta'am, sirul arham. That's the solution. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, say salam to each other. Start there. It's free. Salam is? It's free. Yeah. Just give it. At'imu ta'am. Okay, tell the Torah, because the second part is feed other people. Take someone out for coffee. The day you take someone out for coffee from your masjid, one of these people, if you ever do that, every time you see them, you're going to feel a bond with them that you never felt before. Until then, all of the standing shoulder to shoulder stuff, it's not going to bring in unity. Standing shoulder to shoulder with the Sahaba why it worked is because they fought battles together. You'll find more unity building and five guys playing basketball together for two hours than people praying Salah next to each other for 20 years. Because there's actual communication there. There's reliance, there's dependence. You have to work together for a common goal. Every time you see someone that you played ball with before, you wave at them. 20 years later, you say, yeah, we played lifetime together. I remember that guy. I see him in my lifetime. Masjid, guys, someone died. Good for him. Can't wait for my turn. That's a situation. The first seven years, again, I'm long-winded. 
the first seven years are all about playtime. We need to cut down a little. So Sheikh Hamza said this. He said that we have, America has a big issue with math phobia. Kids are terrified of math. And one of the reasons is because they are introduced to math too, way too early. Right? Way too early. In it. Math is a very important subject, but it has to be delivered like all other subjects at the, at the right time. Muslim curriculum. Historically, if you study Muslim curriculum, they didn't start all subjects at once. They always led one subject to the second, to the third, to the fourth. So if you go to a traditional Islamic seminary, I don't care what part of the world you go to, right? You don't study Islamic law or proper Islamic law to at least fourth or fifth year. Am I right, guys? Those of you who are in Pakistan or some Muslim country, you study the more advanced subjects later on. Is that right, guys? And you come to class day one, they're teaching you fiqh? No, Masai, maybe teach you how to pray salah, that's it. They're not going to teach you real fiqh, though. The first seven years of parenting are all about building good memories. Vacation, go for walks together, do activities together, spend time together. If you've done that, now you've built the foundation of trust and love. Which then leads us to the second phase, the second seven years of parenting, which are education. Muru awladakum bis salah wa huma abnahu sabah sinin. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, now you start telling your children to pray Salah. Now you start telling them to do this, to do that. You separate their beds, boys and girls, girls on this side, boys on that side, in their beds, even siblings. You don't sleep in the same bed anymore. You start separating them and slowly, slowly you teach them. You teach them their Islam. This is very important time. Now, 14 onwards, he says, Musahaba. Now your job is to just be a good companion. Because once a teacher, once a child reaches puberty, they're going to find other sources of knowledge. They're going to find other inspirations. They're going to find different circles, their own personality. If you continue to treat them like they're seven years old or they're ten years old, they're not going to respond well. Parents really, you will see the fruit of what kind of parent you are when your child turns 14. And from there, it's just going to blossom further. What happens is at 15, parents say, oh my goodness. I was supposed to put an apple seed, put a mustard instead. Like, this is messed up. How do I fix it? I don't have an easy answer for you. I really don't. If, you, if, if someone's expecting me to give them an easy answer, I don't have one. I do have some suggestions, which I'll provide in a moment or two. But nothing of it is going to be easy. I know when I tell you what I'm thinking, you're going to say, but that's too hard. And what am I going to say? That's your business. Like, if you don't get it right the first time, the second time around is going to be hard. You're going to have to figure that out. You're going to have to... You're going to have to go above and beyond to fix it. It's not going to be easy. You throw a, a glass on the ground, you smash it. There's no way, there's no scenario that we can repair that easily. All scenarios are going to be difficult. Fahimtum? Musallam, everyone agrees? The first seven years are about, and this is my humble opinion, I also feel that children should not be made to memorize the Qur'an before that age either. You know how parents have their children memorize? One or two surahs is okay, that's good. 10, 15 surahs, no big deal. But you know how some parents, they get their kids... Oh, he's memorized the Qur'an by the time he's seven, eight years old. I don't think this is praiseworthy, by the way. It's not a good thing. Those years were for what? Live your life, man. You're seven years old. The dunya hasn't started yet. Enjoy yourself. Go play. Go do what kids do. Go, go climb a tree and throw an acorn at someone. Go do something like that, yeah? You know, we don't need ten-year-old movies. We don't need ten-year-old chicks. Just be a seven-year-old kid and do what you gotta do. Go enjoy yourself. Have a good time in life. Enjoy the dunya. It's not going to get any easier. Right? Um, um, this is sarahatan. This is what my heart believes that I don't think this is a good thing. Right? A few surahs is a good thing. That way the child knows, has a ta'aluq with the Quran, relationship. They learn to pronounce things properly, learn a little alif bata. That's all good. But this whole like, like helicopter parenting that my child needs to have 10 just memorized by the time they're seven, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of it. The middle seven are about education. Zahniyat banana. Make the child's mind. Help them understand their loyalty to Allah. Help them understand their loyalty to the Prophet of Allah. And build in their mind the importance of education. A good balanced lifestyle. And the last, seven, the, the, the last part of it, those next seven years, you have to realize education is gone from your hands. You won't be able to influence them much. Illa mashallah. There are some parents who will, who will still continue to have that influence and that's the exception. The rest of us, we're going to be banging our head against the wall. I've been telling my son to pray Salah all year, he doesn't listen to me. We're out of that phase, I'm sorry. At this point, you've got to find another way to do it. When someone reaches that last, when they reach that age of adulthood, like I was talking about, bulugh, 
mukallaf, they're now of that age. If you want to bring change in them, you have to realize, in most cases, your change will occur over a period of time if you take a soft, indirect approach. Is that clear? In most cases, what did I say? You have to take a soft, indirect approach, as opposed to taking a direct approach. Take a more soft, indirect approach. So if you notice your child is drifting away from the deen, one thing a soft, indirect approach would be, help them interact with some good Muslim kids. Invite some Muslim kids over to your house for dinner. Once a month, do it. At least they get some face time. They communicate. There's a Muslim basketball tournament. Don't take them to lectures yet. Later, again, soft, indirect. There's a Muslim basketball tournament happening. Better go play some basketball. Get them back into the circle. Get them back into the environment. Slowly. You're not going to get your result in one week or two weeks. And I know it's going to be hard. Finding those people are going to be hard. Because parents, the first thing they say is that we don't have any good Muslim kids in our community. And I'm like, oh, are you sure? That's not a nice thing to say. I'm sure there are good Muslim kids in your community. You're just being lazy right now. You're going to have to go find them. You're going to have to make it happen. You have to build an environment. Right? Mathar Jalisa Saleh has Nabi Sallallahu give that famous example. You have to create a good environment and then let them live in that environment. They'll thrive and grow there. Um, and that's all that I have to say. It's not ideal. But you have to be patient. You almost... I'm not saying that we need to have a defeatist mentality, but I'm going off of my observation. Parents who try to get their children to pray Salah when they're 18, 19 years old, they rarely succeed. And on top of that, that becomes such a stress point in their relationship that that relationship becomes bitter and sour. Relationship's gone. Every day. Uto! Wake up! Salah, 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 salah. Mama, leave me alone. I'm not going to pray. That's, oof, that's a nasty statement to say. No Muslim should ever say that. The last thing I'll say is this, and this is definitely the last thing, inshallah. Inshallah. When people have religious issues, let's say for example, salah, I think that was the example that was mentioned, maybe it wasn't, but bringing them to the masjid, so yeah, salah. When people have issues, when they're not doing something, you have to find out what the root cause behind it is. Are you guys listening? 99% of the Muslim ummah that I have met, and I'm going to stand behind this, majority of the Muslims that I have met, and I'll say 99, not just majority, not 51, I'm talking about like almost everyone. I have never actually, I could say 100% because I never met a person from this other category in my life yet. Maybe one day I might meet someone. I've never met a human, a Muslim in my life, who has disobeyed Allah out of defiance. Do you guys understand defiance? Like, what are you going to do about it, Allah? I'm going to disobey you now. I've never met a Muslim like this in my life. Maybe you have, I don't know. I've never met a Muslim like this who out of jura and defiance, tughyan, said, I'm not going to obey you, Allah. Most people, their disobedience, I see, is a result of weakness in their iman, laziness, and being distracted. One of these three things. Their iman is a little weak, they're distracted, or they're just being lazy. My oldest son is about to be a teenager, and a few years back, I noticed that he was a little falling behind in his salah. So I knew that he wasn't skipping salah, or he wasn't missing salah out of defiance. He's a good kid. You know, like any kid, he's a good kid. And telling him to pray again and again wasn't helping because it was just creating frustration in him, in me, it, was, it wasn't working. And I thought to myself that if I continue telling him salah, 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 that means for the next 20 years I'm going to be the drill sergeant in my home. And that's miserable for me. Forget about him. Am I going to scream and shout for 20 years of my life? I'm not doing that. There has to be a better way to this. So I started studying him. And I noticed that the reason why he wasn't praying salah for him, it wasn't laziness. He was, he's an active kid. He actually doesn't mind praying Salah. The issue was, he was distracted. At that age in his life, when he was around 10 years old, he didn't have the concept of time in his mind. So if I ever asked him, I, I tested this. So randomly I would ask, hey Muhammad, what time is it? He'd say, Abba, I don't know. So, okay. Then I, a few days later I asked him, what time is it? I don't know. So what I noticed that the fact that he didn't have consciousness of time meant that there was no way for him to track the beginning and end of Salah times. That was a problem. Are you guys following me here? So the first thing I did was, for six months, I tried to help him develop consciousness of time. I got him a watch, a fancy one, nice one, with all the buttons and all that stuff, right? Something that he liked. So now I would ask him, I know I can check the time on my phone, but I always asked him. I said, 
about, uh, about it's 12 o'clock. Okay, Jazakallah, right now. Right now, what time is it? For five or six months, I kept asking him, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it? To create what? Consciousness and awareness of time. One part of the puzzle solved. Now we need to solve the second part of the puzzle. The second part of the puzzle was, he now has to become consciousness of Salah time. We create consciousness of time, now we have to create consciousness of Salah time. For this, what I did was, I purchased one of those Adhan clocks. You know those Al Asr, Fajr, Maghrib Adhan clocks? Those ones that sit on the table and they're plugged in the wall and it calls the Adhan in the house. I got one and I plugged it in the wall and I put it somewhere where no one can touch. And it's up high. And they can see it from the balcony on the top floor. So now when it's Salah time, I never tell them, Beta Namaz Pare. I don't ask them if they pray. Neither do I ask them, when are you, I don't even ask them, I, I don't say, did you pray? Or I don't tell them, go pray. I don't say those two statements anymore. These two statements, I have forbidden on myself. I will never say, go pray Salah. And I will never say, did you pray Salah? Now my tactic is, I ask them two questions every Salah time. Beta, what time is it? So then they'll tell me, Abba, it's three o'clock. And I'll say, how much time left for Salah to end? And they'll say, Abba, there's 45 minutes left. And sometimes if I think they need a little bit of push, I'll say, so let me know when you guys plan to pray. That's it. The responsibility is on their shoulders. They get to choose when they're going to pray. Because I'm telling you, if I was on my phone doing business work, or if I was writing an email, and this brother came to me and said, Salah, 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 and I have to walk out in the middle of it, I'm going to be frustrated. Kids are in the middle of a game, and I know we don't take their game seriously, but for them it's an important factor of their life. They're playing a game, they're playing basketball, they're doing something like, hey, stop everything, go pray Salah. Imagine someone did that to you. Stop everything you're doing right now and go pray. One day you might do it, two days you might do it, five days later, what are you going to say? Baba Mafkar, please, leave me alone. So what I've done is that I tell them, you guys pray Salah when you want to. What time is it? How many minutes left for the next Salah? All of it's on that clock. They go there and look at it, and then I say, let me know when you're ready to pray. And they pray. Look for the symptoms. Look for what's causing that defiance. It requires work, it requires brain power. It requires some observation. But the solutions are more soft, they're more indirect. And inshallah, long lasting. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept Rasulullah wa Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Do you have any idea if food is ready downstairs? If you can check with brother uh, Danish or brother Ashraf.